Hi there, I'm Wayne Landis. We're gonna be talking about ecological risk assessment. This is part of a short course for the Pacific Northwest SeaTac meeting. It's gonna be two parts. This is the part that's gonna be talking about ecological risk assessment and the use of Bayesian networks to do that. The uh, second part will be an example, uh, one from the South River. Let me share my screen here. So here we go. This first part is just the use of Bayesian networks and doing ecological risk assessment. And what you see here is a Bayesian network, a really simple one with trout and fish, the dietary exposure, and the area behind us is part of the Sacramento Upper San Francisco Estuary, one of our current research sites. You don't get a chance to ask questions during these kinds of meetings. Send me an email at landis at www.edu and I'll uh, answer your emails. We're going to define risk for this course. We're going to have a short introduction to what a directed acyclic graph is. It's how you build a Bayesian network. Talk about conceptual models. And we'll provide an example. And the second part of this will have a longer example. We're going to be careful in how we define risk. This is what I see from Wiki a lot. A probability of event times the consequence. I don't really know what this calculation is supposed to mean. I'm not really clear what consequence is supposed to be, how large it is, how important it is, and who defines it. Is there an exposure that's assumed? Is there a dose response or some kind of interaction that goes on? And <clears throat> where is the consequence going to happen? We're doing ecological risk assessment. That's a very important aspect. This is a definition from a book the National Academy put out, Gene Drives on the Horizon. And in this report, they define risk as the probability of an effect on one or more specific endpoints due to a specific stressor or stressors. In other words, risk reflects how often a specific change or a change in the environment will affect something of value to the society, human health, outdoor recreation, or survival of endangered species. So this definition is very probabilistically oriented. That means there's gonna be a probability distribution. There's also impl implication of cause and effect, not sim simply association. That's really important as well. Uh, association does not mean causality, and we need to be really careful with that. Uh, just using associations can result in ineffective management because you don't understand the causality and you'll misunderstand something that's highly correlated with the thing you're trying to protect or the activity you see without understanding the causality. We're going to talk shortly about Bayesian networks and how we use them in my laboratory. And everyone pretty much uses them the same way. This is a very short introduction. There are whole books and extensive documentation on this. This is directed acyclic graph for a DAG. The uh, circles are nodes, the arrows are lines of influence. And in terminology, we're going to start to use. And the important thing about this is that uh, there's only one direction. It doesn't loop back on itself. And you can have nodes to uh, variables that are converging on this node or expanding away from it. Uh, and you can actually have them going from one to the other. So this is a very simple directed acyclic graph going left to right. When we think about cause and effect, we're also thinking about a directed acyclic graph. And the way I tend to write how it works is like a source stressor, habitat, where things happen affect uh, the change to an entity within an ecological system. And the impact is a summary of the changes to the endpoints that we care about. This is just a really simple cause and effect pathway. Uh, and it's also a conceptual model. If your conceptual model doesn't imply or doesn't have built into it causality, then in my mind, it's not a conceptual model. It's um, a cartoon does get more involved. This is from our one of our more recent papers. Uh, we have pesticides, water quality, should examine as an endpoint. We have the conceptual model. And if you'll notice here, the boxes are the nodes, the blue lines are the lines of influence. And these are the different aspects of the source stressors, the habitat, in this case, the Chinook habitat, uh, the interactions with the pesticides and other factors. And eventually we have a node that talks about the population dynamics of Chinook salmon. From that, we write in um, a program called Netica, 
uh, Bayesian network. So the directed acyclic graph give rise to a conceptual model, again, which is a DAG, which again, you can derive a Bayesian network, which again is uh, an expression of, in a probabilistic way of the interactions between the different nodes. Uh, and that's what a Bayesian network is. So just some terminology, the two beginning nodes, in this case, I said effect one and effect two are the parent nodes. And when it affects another node as the result from that, that's called the child node. You'll also see daughter node. We've tried to change the terminology. Um, and the rate, the result is the child is determined by what's called a conditional probability table. So these interactions are described by conditional probabilities. In Netica, and that's the software we use, here it is drawn out. We have mercury and trout, mercury and all other fish. The lines of influence have uh, a control over a river dietary exposure. That's the child node. And for each combination of zero mercury, uh, zero, uh, low, high, all these different kinds of concentrations of mercury that we find, you'll find a probability table where if you have zero mercury in all other fish, zero in trout, you'll have a 100% probability of having no uh, mercury in the dietary exposure. When it's high and high, you have 100% and the intermediate nodes, you have other kinds of distributions. So it's the distribution table for the outcomes of various different kinds of uh, inputs. In a uh, conceptual model, any cause effect diagram or a directed acyclic graph, you can calculate risk if you go from this direction, but every equation can be turned around. You just switch which direction the arrow's going and you can see an impact and then you can start looking at what the potential uh, inputs would be, the sources, where it came from, the stressors are responsible for it that actually cause that particular impact. So you can use this to describe risk where you go from source to impact, but also describe uh, what the evidence is or what variables are actually controlling that risk, which is really useful if you're trying to manage a site and so on. And you can do this with the Bayesian networks as well. You can calculate them uh, forward to where you're estimating risk and then actually ask it to go backwards. And it will give you the, the most likely probabilities for giving uh, consistently that particular answer. The relationships in a conceptual model can be determined by exposure response data. Simulation models, we use those quite a bit. Field research, uh, looking uh, what's happened before, put in a control mechanism, and then follow what happens next. And expert elicitation, uh, and in my thought, expert elicitation always has to be backed up by some kind of information, some kind of data. But often an expert can summarize it, or they may have insight or proprietary information you will not have access to. Conceptual models incorporate all kinds of factors, exposure response curves, synergism, antagonism, added responses, thresholds, populations, habitat location extent. One thing I didn't put on here is community structure, uh, community dynamics, productivity, uh, species composition, all those kinds of things can be incorporated into a conceptual model. This is just a simple Bayesian network calculation. Here's a setup. I've used really easy distributions here. You have uh, high and low are the two states. They have the uh, probabilities and then the outcome. Notice that in a Bayesian network in all the things that we do, we always use uh, discrete nodes. Uh, that's one of the things that's required if you're using a Bayesian tool. I've never found this to be an issue. Uh, and essentially we're, we're breaking it and desecratizing it, but it's in ranks. And then here we have the outcome, high, medium, low, and we have equal probability of each. So that's what it looks like. Here's what the conditional probability table looks like, where you have all the different kinds of combinations, and then you have the uh, outputs that are there. I just put this into Excel. The parent nodes are here and their frequencies. The conditional probability table, uh, the various outcomes, uh, the totals. And so you can do this actually in the spreadsheet. It's really difficult to do the calculations, especially when they become more challenging. Uh, 
and some and there's lots of other tools that just aren't going to be available. So yeah, you can do this as part of a spreadsheet, but I would rather not to do that. The example this time is a real one, and this is actually from our South River work. We're trying to look at river dietic exposure to humans. And you can see mercury and trout, uh, not very often, mercury and other fish, uh, which because of where they were in the river and also where they were in the food chain, you'd get some like smallmouth bass with very high concentrations of mercury, others are very low. And then we'd actually calculate what the river dietary exposure was. And here's a line of influence, the parrot nodes, and here's our conditional probability table. When I just showed you that before. So it's a very short introduction, but that's basically what we're doing for all the kinds of calculations that you'll see later. So we have distributions in each case. So we're always doing probabilistic assessments. By definition, we are doing risk assessment. Why do we use these kinds of nodes? Why do we use these diagrams? Because we're actually trying to capture causality. Not every Bayesian network is actually causal. You can do and build them just uh, based on the association, but we have lots of knowledge about how chemicals and other kinds of stressors work in the environment. So we use that additional information from other studies uh, as evidence to actually say which way the directions are, does the causality be moving? Uh, and we really uh, emphasize the causal aspects of it. First thing you need to do is define what you care about, either the sources and stressors of things you're being asked to study or where the, the stressors are coming from and the things you care about, the endpoints. Next, you have to make the connections. That's the challenge, because when you do that, you're describing what the influences are from one step to the next. If you want to talk, think a lot about causality, this is a great book for this. This is Judeo Pearls and Dana McKenzie's book on the book of why. It's talking about cause and effect. I put down the pages that really talk about Bayesian networks and causality in a more specific way. They use other kinds of tools, even though Judeo Pearl initially, he's the inventor of Bayesian networks uh, in the mid 1980s. And he talks about their weaknesses and strengths. And these pages kind of go through and talk about that in more detail. So, plus it's fun. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it. Another really fun book that talks about probability and uh, outcomes is Nate Silver. Uh, he does something famous now on the web. He has a website that makes predictions. It's called the Sigma Noise. It talks about baseball poker and making decisions based on data and based on probability. And it's also a fun read. This is specifically from Pearl. And it's the idea of counterfactuals and what's important. What is uh, understanding causation? We have association down at the bottom, intervention, is uh, experiments and so forth. I'll go more into that and counterfactuals. So the bottom, you understand causality in a more in a weaker fashion, and the the top of the ladder is when you're understanding and how to generate uh, counterfactuals. So often, what we see in our field is association. In other words, we've done lots of monitoring lots of work. We may, may have monitored it for years and years and years. Monitoring programs are often set up without real understandings of causality. Uh, they're required by regulation or this would be a good idea. But uh, most of the monitoring programs I see generated uh, do not have a conceptual model, some kind of causal model as describing them. So that's the association level. And people do data mining, look for associations and so forth. Uh, this is very commonly done, but remember, this is only an association, especially when using tools like PCA, various kinds of regressions and so on, to actually describe relationships. The, this is all looking at association. Intervention. This is like a before and after control uh, imp implementation or experiments in a laboratory or in field settings. Now you're doing experiments to actually look and see if these causal linkages are there. How can I make the symptom occur? If I do chemical X, what do I see? So this is better. You're actually building that evidence that these cause and effect relationships are there. Uh, it's not just mere association. So 
this is what we do better in the field. Bio, bio, biomarker research can be part of that, mesocosms, laboratory tests, uh, and going out into the field. So this is the second ring, rung of the ladder. The third one is counterfactuals. Imagining if, um, what if, if I do this, then these things kinds of occur, especially for things that are very different kinds of uh, situations. Uh, was it a chemical that reduced the insect population in a particular part of the Columbia River? Uh, or is it the slag coming down from a smelter from Canada? Now you can take that information you know about insects, uh, how they affect perhaps macroinvertebrate populations, uh, what you know about slag and the chemicals are in there, and you're using a very specific site, the Columbia River. Now we can make and test predictions, look at confounders, things that may change it, and manage the system in an adaptive manner because you keep making hypotheses about causality and reevaluating them. So now we can make management predictions. In our research, what we focus on is the counterfactual level. So here's a ladder of causation all filled out uh, specifically towards the kinds of work we do in our ecological risk assessments. In contrast, there's this thing called the weight of evidence, which is so often used and is seen as a cold standard. Mm, I guess it's only if it's fool's goals. That's my, my approach. It's better than what was done before we had uh, some ideas about causality, but this is a pretty basic level. And I'll show you why in just a second. These are the ones that are typically used, strength of association, consistency, specificity, time order, biological gradient, experimental evidence, biological plausibility. So these are the criteria often used for weights of evidence. But where do they fit? Where do they fit into our ladder? Well, here I've grouped them together. The first three, these are correlations. And does association uh, infer causality? No, we know that correlation does not specify causality. We know that we've had many cases where things are well correlated, but they're not causal. So we're still not understanding cause yet. The time order of temporality, biological gradients, experimental evidence. Now we're kind of getting into the second line where we're doing experiments and so forth, but we're still not going out and making that last big plunge. And then biological plausibility, does it comport with the other kinds of things that we know? Does it make sense with already established knowledge? That's almost getting to a counterfactual, but it's still not predictive to new situations yet. So weight of evidence is useful, but most of it is on those bottom rungs of the ladder of causality. Well, actually even the biological plausibility, you're still comparing it to what you think you know, and it's important if it doesn't match, but you're still not extrapolating to something beyond your initial data set. So yeah, so what are the counterfactuals? And that's what that, that's shorthand for that top rung. So now we have some clear idea about how to evaluate the connections. And now let's talk about that as far as the Bayesian networks and this kind of influence diagram. So there can be interactions among these pathways. Here's the normal one we write, stressor one, habitat one. I didn't put in sources this one, effect, impact. Of course, in my world, there's always multiple stressors. There's never just one chemical, never just one change in pH, so forth and so on. So in this case, we've written the nodes as random variables. <clears throat> the links here are the pathways of influence or the lines of influence. And the impact is the thing that we're actually trying to predict. An impact is the association uh, kind of trying to add up or evaluate effect one and effect two, um, which are effects to the endpoints. So the impact is trying to give you an overall indication of what the risk would be of the totality of the impact would be to the particular system that we're studying. So we're gonna just have a simple application of a Bayesian network to think about our causality thinking along these lines. Um, we're gonna look at Puget Sound Herring, which is an old standby of mine. We've done that work a lot. It's kind of fun to do as well. So the situation is modeled after a couple of papers of ours back in the day. 
variety of data and population modeling we've done to this issue. So we're, we're basing it on that. Um, we've had a loss of older age class specific herring throughout the 161 kilometer extent of Puget Sound. So it's a very large region. We've seen this loss of older age class throughout the region. We have at least two, gene two genetic populations within it. The one I talk about a lot is at Cherry Point. Um, the rest of the ones in Puget Sound are distinct from that. Climate change, persistent widespread pollutants and disease were identified as potential causes in an older paper now and before we started using uh, Bayesian networks. So the Landis and Bryant paper was going through a classic way of, uh, of evidence analysis. And we'll talk about how you can draw that up and actually make it more complete by using a Bayesian network. So here we have various causes for what we were thinking were uh, potentially altering the environment in the Puget Sound. Pops, of course, persistent organic pollutants, methylmercury, non-indigenous species, which we know occur within the Puget Sound region, disease, something else we know that occur, and climate change. We have the types of effects. Uh, we have the chemicals, the direct toxicity, and the non-indigenous species disease and climate change are altering the habitat. We have an endpoint, which is actually the population status of the um, Puget Sound Pacific herring population. We're also looking, and we know this, uh, that there's been a lack of recruitment that's ongoing to the herring as they come into spawn. And then the definitive, um, by looking at the population models, one of the potential causes of the decline is the loss of older age class fish. The older fish, the larger fish produce more eggs and their chances of reproducing even greater. So if you lose the older age class fish, you're gonna reduce recruitment uh, to, some, to some degree. And then there what the probability decline is. And this one, I've already done the calculation where in this particular case, it's high. So this is the probability of decline. We know because of our research that these kinds of chemicals do cause toxicity. These kinds of stressors do alter the habitat. We know that because Puget Sound is one of the most extensive studied marine habitats in the world. Uh, and so we're using a lot of that information to inform these lines of influence. Be careful of, of, of the two. You have stress from one and two going through here, doing all this. They look almost the same and, and you had two effects and geez, here's the impact. This is almost the same, except from this effect, there's no line to the impact. This effect isn't really going to change it. How are you gonna tell them apart? Well, you have to go through and kind of tease this part out and see how much of that linkage is there. This is really difficult to do, but it is possible by doing some calculations, what's called a sensitivity analysis. That sensitivity analysis will tell you if the variables along this pathway, how much they're contributing to the prediction of this particular impact. So you can tell them apart. Current status in 2010, this is the last time we went and collected data for this. We actually found out is that the habitat alteration, here's the disease, habitat alteration. Here are basically the symptoms that were discovered. We knew that we had low amounts of herring and then we calculated what the risk was. So we went through and said, okay, here's what it is today. Here are the calculations. And here's what the calculation risk was. Now let's go through and see what changes in this calculation. If we say that the herring population is gonna have low risk, medium risk, and high risk. So right here we went through and did a calculation where we're gonna do the calculation backwards now we're actually setting low risk to the herring population. So they've set it low. So now in the Bayesian network, it's calculating backwards to what the most likely distribution is to give this particular population outcome, to give this risk outcome. And you'll see that the change here and these is quite substantial. These don't change so much, but if you look through here and do the sensitivity analysis, this disease and climate change that have the most influence the way this is written up right now uh, on saying whether or not the risk to the Puget Sound Pacific herring population is high or low. So you can see it visually. 
and you can go through and actually think of the other things that have occurred. Uh, the distributions for climate change and disease were skewed towards the lower numbers. Uh, if you actually put in disease to low and even leave the rest of everything alone, you're kind of doing that, that status and population status high, you'll see that risk also goes low. So you can do these kinds of counterfactual experiments using the Bayesian network. So here it is, low risk, high population, disease, uh, and climate change are here. Now you can see the influence that maneuvering these things around, putting different inputs, will go through and change what the risk is. Turns out in this case that the contaminants really don't have nearly as much influence the way this model is set up compared to the others. Again, you can set disease um, to low and, and uh, certain other, uh, and the endpoint high, and you can go through and see that the risk is still high, even with disease at a fairly low concentration, uh, fairly low incidence. You can actually go through and say, okay, here's, here's our risk, here's the different inputs, and you can compare a low risk situation to a high risk situation with the POPs, the metals, the non-indigenous species, barely change. Disease turns out that you can have that low and look at what climate change does. Climate change can change dramatically in the distribution. The other thing that's important that even though uh, it doesn't look like a change in distribution, remember the sensitivity analysis says that even small changes to some of these variables like climate change can produce big impacts on the risk to these um, endpoints. So you can go back through and evaluate how the inputs change and how valuable, how sensitive the model is to those calculations, high, medium, and low risk. That's one of the useful parts of a Bayesian network is that you can play with the information, you can play with the model that incorporates your knowledge and start asking these counterfactual kinds of questions. That's the critical part. Persistent chemicals um, can be uh, important at higher levels perhaps if with you don't have disease, climate change is more important. If you don't have disease, non-indigenous species don't have much control. They're not that big a uh, impact to this bigger model. Large individual changes and stressors are not necessary to greatly change the risk. This is enormously important when it comes to thinking about management strategies. There may not be a magic bullet. Uh, in fact, you may have to make subtle changes and put resources into changing several of the aspects to actually get the outcome, the management outcome that you desire. So what's cool here, Bayesian networks and diagrams are establishing personal probabilities. And it means personal in some ways, but personal because you have the information and so forth in so many ways. You can look at interaction between the different pathways and the analysis, it forces you to be systematic and transparent with your analysis. Everything is written down in the models and the software we use there's lots of notes about how each node, how each one of those boxes, uh, about the information in it, what the data set is behind it, the conditional probabilities and so forth. So if you just send someone your model, you've been enormously transparent about what it is that you did. And we're gonna stop right there. I'm gonna make a copy of that. I don't wanna have too large a file size and we'll come back in just a minute and uh, provide an example. Thank you.